Uh, so welcome everyone to episode five of Free Kiwis. Uh, we're very honored today to have uh, Dr. Jamie White, who uh, was, as most New Zealanders will know, formerly the uh, party leader of the ACT Party. Um, however, he's uh, had a varied career, and I believe he started out as an academic. He got a PhD in philosophy from Cambridge. Uh, Jamie, I actually, actually wanted to start out there because Michael and I have a lot of concerns at the moment about academic freedom, the environment uh, for free thought and free speech in the university. Um, and uh, we just wanted to get your thoughts about Cambridge. I mean, what was it like when you were there? Uh, did you feel like you could uh, speak freely? Was there uh, a certain view that was recommended uh, on Cambridge campus at that point in time, etc.? Well, actually, it's funny that you should ask that because I the, what's been going on over the last, let's say, five years or something, um, this, this consciousness of a lack of academic freedom, it reminded me of something that happened. Uh, when I finished my PhD at Cambridge, I got a research fellowship at Corpus Christi College. And um, one of the things that you're expected to do uh, as a new fellow in the college is to give a talk uh, about something in your subject, but a talk that all the other academics in the college who aren't specialists in your field could understand. <clears throat> and I gave a talk, um, which I subsequently published, called Relativism is Absolutely False. And this was, um, the reason I gave this talk is that relativistic ideas were very popular at that time, not only in philosophy of science, which was my field, but you know, in all sorts of disciplines, in all the social sciences, even in law, certainly in literature. And so <clears throat> I, and I've been hearing about this and arguing with people you know, for well, the three years of my PhD. And so I, I gave this talk to my, uh, the other fellows in my college, and then I gave the talk to the weekly seminar of the Department for the uh, History and Philosophy of Science, with which I'd been associated. Um, over the years. <clears throat> so I gave this weekly seminar. I feel, oddly enough, I, I clearly knew I was going into battle because uh, the date I, I gave a handout, as you all, we did in those days, we didn't have, we gave, I gave a paper handout for everybody. And on it, instead of having the date, I had written Waitangi Day, um, which it happened to be when I gave this talk. Um, anyway, in the talk, I you know, made arguments. It was all you know, proper analytic philosophy. Um, but although it was delivered, it was, it was one of your slightly more kind of polemical kinds of talks. You know, at the end of it, <clears throat> there was a certain amount of normal debate, you know, had I made my points well or not. And at a certain point, a chap, so just, this is 1992, um, a, a chap at the, sort of the back of the room, he was a, an expert on Charles Darwin, he's a historian of science. And he stood up and he said that I should be ashamed of myself for what I'd done. Um, what had I done? Right? Well, what I'd done is I'd given a talk uh, dismissing relativism as a kind of muddled, confused, and ultimately ridiculous idea to a lot of people who were relativists. And this was a wicked thing to have done. In fact, he compared me to somebody who was notorious at the time there was a chap, a policeman, who had said that AIDS victims were swimming in a cesspool of their own creation. And he said that I was the equivalent of that police constable, chief constable, going to a, a congress of gay rights activists and, and making that statement. That's what I had done, something like that. And I remember saying to him, I said, look, it's, uh, you know, aren't we scholars, aren't we academics here? Is this a, I didn't know I was dealing with something religious. Um, and then afterwards, we all, as always, you go off to the pub afterwards and people were coming up to me and going, tut, tut. They honestly were kind of saying, tut, 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 tut. you know, what have you done? Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's a long time ago. Um, and so it's been, it's been around a long time. I wasn't worried about it as the difference, right? So <clears throat> I knew that nothing was going to come of that, that I was fine, right? People may have thought that I was an asshole but I wasn't going to lose my job. I wasn't going to lose any of my friends. It wasn't going to be difficult. So there were no consequences. 
And I think that's probably what's changed. Um, the, the level of fear. It, it, I wasn't frightened of doing that and I wasn't frightened after it had, it had gone wrong. But those ideas were brewing. Um, and the, the idea that, what is the idea? The idea is something like, uh, the pursuit of truth has to be constrained by your f concerns about the feelings, how people might feel when they hear what you have to say. And that if you're a decent person, you won't say things, even important things, if you think that they're going to upset people. It's something like that, I suppose. And that idea is, seems to have taken off. Uh, over the years. So when you gave that talk, I suppose it was the heyday of postmodernism in the, in the academy. Uh, it was, yeah. which, we, which we might see as the crucible of this radical relativism. Uh, interestingly, tucked in behind it seems to be one absolute truth, which is that everything is relative. I suppose it's the flip side of what you're arguing in that, in that talk. You were saying uh, relativism is absolutely false, whereas the relativists say the one thing that is absolutely true is that everything is relative, uh, which seems a paradox, <laughs> in fact. Um, but but I think you're right that behind that is a whole lot of emotional baggage, or or the emotional baggage has come in at some point uh, to kind of rule out anything that's perceived as, especially uh, making minorities or people who are, who are seen to be vulnerable uh, uncomfortable or. Yeah, interestingly, in this case, and, and it wasn't anything to do with minorities or the vulnerable or anything like that. It was really a, a much broadly, it, it was like it had been excessively rude. Uh, and the, the vulnerable group, the, what, the group upset weren't vulnerable. I mean, they were, you know, mainly white men, uh, some women at that time as well, of course, but mainly white men who happened to believe something that I didn't believe. And for some reason, this belief of theirs, that, well, not not necessarily all of them. I shouldn't put this on all of them, right? Some of them want to just have a straightforward argument with me, but there were some who thought that I just shouldn't say these things. So it was it, another difference back then was that it wasn't so much about race. Race, gender was coming up as a thing. So there was feminist philosophers coming through and there was a kind of feminist philosophy of science or feminist epistemology that was starting to emerge, which said that the, we'd had this kind of the, uh, analysis of knowledge hadn't taken into account things like gender because it apparently has no relevance, right? I mean, how do you know stuff? What's the difference between a justified belief and an unjustified belief? How, to science, how do you test a scientific theory? The kinds of things that philosophers of science were looking at you would have thought that it had nothing to do with uh, gender but some philosophers were coming through mainly women of course saying that it, it did gender was relevant and you could get in a bit of trouble you didn't want to be too strident in arguing against that stuff race hadn't hadn't come up um and certainly transgenderism and the, those kinds of issues weren't around yet either but I agree that I think that the, what was going on at the time <clears throat> was the idea that it was a kind of weakening of the idea of truth and uh, rationality or reason. The idea that these were merely constructs by the dominant group in society. And that, that laid the ground for what we've seen later. Yeah. Now, it's interesting you, that you mentioned the postmodernism uh, and the relativism in particular, or Michael brought in postmodernism, because um, I know that Helen Pluckrose thinks that there was a phase in postmodernism, and you can see this in a lot of the, uh, the, the source texts, where it was actually quite playful. It was sort of like, you know, we don't, we don't really know. There are various narratives, competing narratives. Um, we can sort of play around with these. And then more recently, I, I know that Pluckrose and Lindsay in the cynical theories book, think that we re entered a phase of so-called applied post uh, applied postmodernism, where the thought is kind of along the lines that Michael was saying is, you know, there's relativism, but it's not just a playful thing because actually underneath all, we, we can relativize everything, we can historicize everything you say, but at the bottom of it, there there are some strong claims. Actually, the strong claims are things like 
you know, white men have privilege. Um, there, there is a, quite a substantive view of the world uh, behind all this. So you should be happy, right? Because now they're, they're not so relativistic. <laughs> yeah, I, it's not clear to me that what's going on is quite relativistic. Um, these are very complex notions, but it, it's, so it's not that it's not that relativism is the view roughly that uh, belief makes that, that what it, what's true depends on what you believe is true, right? So if uh, the the true opinion about let's say uh, homosexuality, the morality of it, depends on the culture that you're in. So if you are in um, Uganda homosexuality is immoral because that's the generally held view there. So truth is relative to the beholder. Sometimes it's a big group of beholders. Sometimes it's that, that would be cultural relativism. Sometimes it's just the, uh, an individual that would be subjectivism. But what you're seeing now is slightly different. So if you take the view that what, whether you're a man or a woman, your gender or your, your sex, I'm not sure, the distinction between gender and sex, I'm not sure, but you know what I mean. Are you a man or a woman or, or something else? Well, that's entirely up to the person in question, right? If, if they, just, this is the, the idea, one of the ideas blowing around, that if you, if you, I'm, I could now tell you that I'm a woman, right? And uh, you've got, then you can't question that, that I am a woman, right? I don't have to do anything, I don't have to look like a woman, I have to, now, that's not, that's not uh, relativism, mm. because on the relativist view, whether or not I'm a woman depends on what you think I am, right? It's you're, you're the beholder. Truth is relativist, uh, relative to the beholder. On this view, I make myself a woman by saying I'm one, and that's an absolute fact, and if you don't believe me, you're just wrong, right? That's not relativism. So we, we, that might that's we, something more radical in some ways. Could we, could we call it linguistic determinism or something like that? Where you are well, whatever you say you are. Ling, linguistic creationism might be a better, better right. word. I mean, I, I make not relativistic facts. I make absolute reality by my mere declarations. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a wild view, right? Yes. Um, of course, it's reserved only for some things. Nobody thinks that I could, I could, you know, make my computer a carrot by saying my computer's a carrot, or it, it's only in certain areas where this magical power exists. That's right, and in fact, um, I, I think that the proponents of this worldview w would also balk at the idea that you could make yourself black by saying so. In yes, fact, oh God. In okay, fact, you get into terrible trouble if you tried. <laughs> I know this was amazing. When, when the Leanne Dalziel, is it? Or, yes. Is that her name? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Dalziel. I remember thinking that it was really fascinating that what she had done was considered an absolute travesty, a dreadful behavior, <laughs> pretending to be black when you're actually white. And what's odd about it is that if you look at the biological basis of race, there's not much to it. Uh, it's like, you know, it's. There's not much difference between a black man and a white man. Um, maybe none, some people argue, but you know, it, it, it's very small. There's a huge biological difference between a man and a woman. And yet, the, that's the thing, that you can just make yourself the other by saying so. But the one where you're actually dead close, you yes. can't. It, it's so peculiar, and it's obviously, in a way, entirely arbitrary. And, and you, you know, we all know what the rules are. Or well, if you keep up, you do. You know, poor old people who you know, get lost and they blunder in there because they haven't kept up with the rules and they don't know what the right words are. And they're, and they're trying to be nice, but they, they muck it up because they're not paying enough attention. Um, and by the way, that's part of the game. Right? You're always changing the rules so that the people who don't keep up can get screwed. Um, but, but anyway, you know, we all, people like you and me, we know what the rules are. We know that you can... You can change your um, gender by mere say so, but not your race. But we don't. You could. You couldn't. And in all, I, I, I could not tell you the reasoning behind that. I know that that's the rule, but I can't give you a rationale for it. Oh, I, don't, I don't think that rationale is in vogue, is it? I, I, as far as I can tell, it's got nothing to do with rationality. It's, it's more of a political weapon than, 
than anything yeah. else. I, I, I think okay, so, um, you know, maybe I'm just not working hard enough. Maybe there are exp people do provide explanations about why it's very wrong to change race, but not to change gender. Well, I don't, I don't have an explanation for that, but maybe I, I can make an attempt at a, at a halfway rationale. Um, it, it is, I believe, something you know, known in analytic philosophy. I'm thinking of the, the speech act theory of uh, J.L. Austin, that you know, in some circumstances, you can say things which then have uh, reality in the world, right? So I think his classic uh, um, example was a marriage ceremony. You know, by, by speaking certain words, then then you're you're married. Or something which you weren't earlier. So, is there some yeah. room for them to say, you know, along the same lines, you can declare yourself a certain identity or, or something like that? Well, I mean, you. So the the J. L. Austin theory is that you do things by making statements. So, and that's obviously true. And in some cases, you do some pretty pretty big things, like getting married. Um, but I don't think that anybody ever thought that you could do things like changing a man into a woman by saying saying that you've done it. Um, almost all of these things that you can do with words are things that are uh, to do with um, what other people believe. So whether or not you're married is in some sense to do with what other people believe. Um, that's, what you do, that's, that's why you should get married in public, in my opinion, by the way. Um, you're, you're saying to all the community, okay, we're married now, and you, know, you guys got to kind of hold us to it. And, and that's what's going on there. And, and that's why it is a kind of performative act. Um, but being, being a woman isn't a performative act. Um, it, there's more to it than that. Um, and that's why you can't, there are some things that you can do with words, but there are some things you can't do with words. Um, you can't build a house with words. You can't say, you know, so I, I think you're trying too hard for them. I mean, it, it is, well, I think, by the way, I, I don't mean to sound weird about this uh, or nasty about this. I think I'm completely comfortable with people changing their sex. Um, I've got no issue with it. Um, I just think, basically, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm to think you have to pass as the other sex, right? But I mean, I, I'm willing to take someone seriously saying that they've changed from a man to a woman. If they've, you know, they've done certain things and they they are living as a woman and i mean I, in a way i don't even care right i mean live how you know i'm a libertarian live however you want i don't care i just don't want to be forced to say crazy stuff like uh now you really are a woman or especially about those those ones who don't do anything at all don't even try to pass as women and then get upset when people say hey mister to them you know they look like a man why, why are you getting upset if you present as a man and people think you're a man I don't yes know. anyway yeah. Um, I don't know how we put onto this. <laughs> I, su I suppose there's a there, there is a more substantive side to it for biological women when biological men start being put in women's prisons and so on. Uh, uh, otherwise, yeah. I I agree with you. I, 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 as a fellow libertarian, I, I have no issue whatsoever with how people want to be, but I do have an issue with them trying to force everybody else to see things their way. I suppose. And, um, yeah, I don't want to be yeah, exactly. I don't want to be told. Uh, uh, I think I should tolerate, you know, anybody's conduct if they don't harm me. Um, why should I care? You know, it's, it's their life. On the other hand, I don't want to be kind of get in trouble if I if I uh, say you know you're not a, you're not a woman or yeah. you know what, why why should I get in trouble for that? The prisons thing is interesting. That's about the only case that I can see where there's a real problem here. The other two cases that are brought forward are sport and um, toilets. Now, in sport, I think the answer is pretty simple, which is just that let the, let the sporting bodies, which are almost all private organisations, decide for themselves. The rugby union recently did. They said, you know, women, women shouldn't, uh, men, trans women, people who were men and now women shouldn't play rugby. That's up to them. It's their, it's their game. If the trans people want to get another, you know, they can set up their own league and, and not have that rule, okay? And let's see who wants to watch and who wants to play, right? Yeah. So we can just leave this to the private. And with toilets, it's kind of the same. I mean, toilets are almost always supplied in private places. Just let the suppliers of the toilets decide what rules are suit their customers best. And, you know, I, I think toilets does really weird. I mean, 
I don't know who's in toilets. I mean, who, who knows who cares? Right? But uh, prisons is a bit, bit tricky because there have been cases, I think it was a case in, in the UK, uh, where a trans woman that still had a penis uh, raped other inmates. So that, that's clearly a serious uh, question. Yeah. Um, there's a flip side though, which is that if you are a trans uh, woman, it might be very dangerous to be put in a men's prison. Yeah. So uh, that's a real yeah. problem to which I, you know, I'm not going to try to say I've got the answer, but it's a, it can't be a massive problem though. I don't know how many of these people are in prison. No, no. I don't, I don't, you know, but but there, is a, there is a true d dilemma there as far as I, I, I guess the thing about a prison is that it's a compulsory environment. And so, exactly. and I, I suppose this is a slight uh, digression, but from a libertarian perspective, it's an anomaly in that respect. And it's the one thing that I worry about privatizing, because if the state is putting somebody in a compulsory environment, then it seems to me that the state has a responsibility to look after them in that environment. And so I, I'm not so sure about the, the idea of privatizing prisons in that respect, given that it, they wouldn't even exist if there wasn't a state. So. I, I agree with you and for other reasons as well. Uh, so one of the reasons, if you think about what, why is privatization on the whole a good thing? It's because uh, private suppliers respond to consumers' preferences. Uh, well, nobody wants to be in prison. Uh, you know, the, the consumer here is the state, right? So it's, a, it's just a single consumer. And as you say, that they've created this situation. And I don't, you, I don't see that you're gonna get lots of gains in consumer surplus of the kind that you do in a normal market through privatizing prisons. The other, and it's a second order effect, is that once you privatize prisons, you create a, um, uh, an interest group, the, the owners of the private prisons, an interest group who want more people to be in prison, right? Because that's how they make their money. And I'm not sure they want there to be uh, people who profit from other people being put in prison. I, I'm not sure that create, that's a great incentive. So uh, I, there are lots of reasons to worry about the privatization of prisons. Always weirded me out a bit. I mean, there are efficiency gains. Apparently that they are a bit more efficient. But it's always struck me strange that both, uh, you know, on the right of politics in New Zealand, which I, we all know it's a rough term, but you know what I mean. They were so keen on, what, why, why did they make prison privatization uh, such an issue? I mean, I'd much rather privatize schools. You've got proper consumers there, right? People want to go to school. Uh, they certainly want their kids to go to school. Maybe the kids don't want to go. But uh, yeah, that's what we should privatize. Never mind bloody prisons. Yeah. yeah. Might be a good point actually to uh, shift to talking a little bit more about New Zealand politics. And in particular, we're, we're interested again in the, in the atmosphere for free speech. Um, so maybe we can actually just start with the ACT Party because they had a big uh, boost at the last election. And to some extent, I think this was due to just national um, you know, not being on top uh, at the top of its game. And so uh, Axe sucked up some of the right wing vote. But to what extent do you think that um, the Axe support now reflects some emerging kind of pushback in this, in this culture war and, and a desire for free speech? Because David Seymour did make that a big part of his campaign. I, I think it's a big part of it. Um, Act always does better uh, when they're out of government, when Labour's in, because they're a much more effective opposition than national, not just because the national has been very poor uh, in this term, but because acts got a bit more in the way of principle. And when you think about it, national's done almost everything that Labour does, and so it's very hard for them to be fiercely critical of the government because you know, they could instantly be accused of hypocrisy. I mean, all they can really ever say is, uh, "We we would be a bit more efficient than you are." at running the basically, basically the same arrangement, right? Same relationship between the state and, and the people. Act's got a slightly more um, solid uh, kind of pro-markets, pro the individual position, and so they can be a bit more effective. And this really came to the fore in the last term because you had the response to the Christchurch uh, shootings in the mosques, which was the 
um, anti-gun stuff and the anti-free speech stuff. And David Seymour uh, was the only member of parliament to vote against those measures, uh, which is a pretty, I mean, it was a fantastic, uh, I, I was so proud of him from a principal point of view, but also it was courageous and smart uh, politics. Because of course, a lot of people in the country had to be, I mean, when we say a lot, I mean, in act, when you're saying a lot, you mean 10%. Yeah. Uh, you know, 10% of the population, at least, has got to be opposed to that stuff, right? Uh, you know, the percentage of the population that were kind of principled libertarians, the research that we had done in ACT when I was there, suggested it was about 1% of the population at most. But on certain particular issues, especially ones that affect them directly, like, you know, I'm a gun owner, or I like to be a bit of an asshole on Twitter, uh, you can get a, you can get more of a, a response, and at, if you look at when ACT's been successful on policy fronts, it's been that they touched a nerve, they 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 got on some there was something going on. Rodney Hyde did well on top the tough on crime stuff. Um, that that has kind of passed, I think, as a political uh, issue. But so I think that David got that dead right. Um, he got it right both in principle and in in practical politics and I think it's a big part of why ACT has done so well at this last election. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great news. And to what extent, I mean you, you've sort of said this, that David himself is an important part of that. He's, he's obviously a, a courageous and effective politician and in some ways it, it, it must be a little bittersweet for you. You, you took over ACT at a time of uh, when the party was a bit moribund uh, it, it always struck me as very strange that they made John Banks leader, who strikes me as a more of an old style conservative than a libertarian. And, and you took it over when it was in a fairly parlous state. And um, to my mind, you prepared the ground for, for David, although I'm not sure that's what was in your mind when you became ACT leader outside <laughs> parliament. Do, do you want to talk a bit about that time and, and tell us how it actually was? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um... It's true that John Banks was an unusual person to be the leader of um, ACT. And I think that the fact that he was the leader of ACT and an unusual person to be in that position was very damaging to ACT because you'd had a period where, I mean, ACT was founded by Roger Douglas and, um, Richard Preble. Uh, uh, Preble and those guys, right? Uh, the people from, um, there were some guys from the National Party, but it was basically the people who had gone through the Roger Douglas Revolution and the Labour Party. And they wanted to continue on that agenda. And it, it did quite well at first, and it was considered a pretty principled uh, party. And then Rodney Hyde became leader. Um, and he was also, I think, popular in many ways. And he's a smart guy, uh, quite learned, right? He, he played a few political games, but he was reasonably principled. Then he got rolled by um, Don Brash. Don, now, Don's a friend of mine. I, I like Don, but Don... And then Don also engineered um, John Banks taking over the party. And it gave the impression that the ACT Party was becoming a vehicle for old politicians who couldn't bear giving up their little bit of, you know, involvement and power, and that it wasn't really any longer a party of um, principle. Um, it was just something kind of tawdry. Um, I think that was the view. Maybe with some, uh, some justification. Uh, I, I think that would, I, I, I can't really say that about um, Don Brash. I, he is, a, He's a very principled man, but but anyway, that was the perception that was that was um, out there. When, as I say, I think certainly, you know, John Banks had been running for mayor. There was all the Kim dot com stuff. It all looked kind of dodgy. Um, now I got parachuted in, as they say, and um, you know I was very naive politically, and that was obvious, and kind of perhaps over principled for a practical politician. And though I no, I mean, we were polling 0%. Uh, 
literally zero. Then, you know, during the campaign, it was nudging up a bit, a bit. In the end, I got 0.71% of the vote. Um, but I think that we moved from being um, tawdry to being irrelevant, <laughs> which, uh, no, that doesn't sound like a great achievement, but I think I, I, the one thing I think maybe I did is I slightly detoxified the brand, right? That's to say, like, oh, this guy's, but I think a lot of people, if they even knew who I was at all, thought I was a crackpot of some kind, but not, not, um, not self-serving crackpot, you know, not a, a, not a kind of corrupt politician crackpot. So then David took over after I lost. He didn't do any good in the first term, right, when he was in with National. He got even less. He got 0.5% of the vote. Um, and I was seriously worried that the party was going to become completely irrelevant. I mean, he was really just going to die. But then I think he's just you know, played a blinder uh, over the last three years, especially post the Christchurch thing. And now I think the party is, I mean, when I have more <laughs> crazy ideas, I wonder if ACT couldn't become a really, really major force in New Zealand politics. The, the National Party is in a bad, bad state, it seems to me. Um, they don't really stand for anything. The sense that they're filled with competent people doesn't, doesn't seem right anymore. <clears throat> Politics is really shifting. All the, all the, the groupings, right, the standard groupings of people and who they vote for, that is changing radically all around the Western world. And um, what I want to emerge is what you might call a populist libertarianism. Uh, now, is such a thing possible? Uh, it was in you know in the early days in the United States, you know it was a very popular movement. Don't boss me around. Don't tell me what to do. I'm an individual. Don't tread on me. That was the you know the the saying, the coiled snake. Um, that's what I want to see emerge. What I'm seeing emerge in Europe is a populist collectivism, both on the left and on the right. My great hope for New Zealand is you could get a populist individualism, a populist libertarianism. And, you know, David at the moment is, is leading that movement. And, you know, that's, that's the spirit, of, I think, of the people who voted for ACT at this end. Not populist conservatism, uh, collectivism, populist individualism. Yeah, I mean, that certainly seems to be, he seems to be the greatest hope of, of bringing that about. Uh, at the moment, as you say, both on the left and the right around the world, and in the United States, in, in Europe, it all seems to be tending in a collectivist direction. Uh, mm -hmm. And so really the, the movement that you're hoping for, and, and I, I would agree with you, uh, we can't really see that where that's coming from as yet, but, but I suppose one might hope that when those who have latent individualistic instincts start to wake up to the fact that the collectivist steamroller is truly threatening to them, that that, that might be the time when that, that happens. Yeah, it's a very curious thing here in England trying to work out, <clears throat> I mean, it's all moving fast, but if you look at the response to the, the COVID-19, there's a very high correlation between people who voted for Brexit and people who are skeptical about the lockdowns and the government's involvement in this kind of thing. And there's all of this, and, and why, why would that be? Why is there that correlation? Well, it's, it's kind of anti the big distant authorities, right? Telling me what to do. They didn't like the European Union for that reason. Um, now I had always worried. I thought, well, I still do worry, but Brexit was a kind of nationalist collectivist movement. And there are signs of that. On the other hand, the fact that so many Brexiteers are hostile to the national government and their, um, the, their impositions during the, the COVID crisis makes me wonder if there couldn't be something to tap into there uh, on a more you know, resistance to authority more generally kind of uh, sentiment. I think that sentiment is there. Um, 
know, I think what we need to do is you know, get them, get their hostility towards the European Union to shift to the national government. <laughs> and then maybe we can get regionalism and then maybe even smaller. You know. that, would be, that would be a trend I'd like to see. Yes, I, I, I'd hoped that um, Boris Johnson w would be a bit of a, an advance guard for that kind of movement, but he's been a terrible disappointment. And I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. He's, he's a, an arch politician, I, I guess. But um, I, I, at the moment, I can't see much resistance to the, the idea of, of COVID lockdowns and safety at all costs anywhere. Uh, so you well, say there's a correlation with, with Brexit supporters, but isn't it the case that 90 odd percent of of UK residents are, are supportive of lockdowns and want to see even more stringent restrictions? Yes, it's about, yes, it's about 85 percent. Um, I'll tell you an even more amazing statistic that I saw in a survey. There were, people asked, if there were a vaccine available, this is before the vaccine was announced, if there were a vaccine available and everybody had got it, <clears throat> would you still be in favour of lockdowns? And 48 percent said yes. Mm. I, mean, I don't know what I, I, I got the horrible feeling that some people actually like living in a locked down society I've heard um, people say so but can I, um, maybe I'll try and put, put the argument on the other side again because uh, we, some people, I know people who are pretty, pretty good sort of liberals in the old sense you know, Sam Bauman or, or whatever who will say well of course even the most died in the world libertarians will admit that you know, you, you want to take measures for certain safety reasons. And so the way that they're looking at this is that they think it's, it's, it's a dangerous disease. It is a dangerous disease to, you know, especially for over 70s. And, you know, the more of it that, that's around, uh, the worse it's going to be for that group is the theory. So surely even for, even for dying in the world libertarians, there, there's some uh, argument that, uh, that we should limit freedom in cases like this. Oh, sure. I wasn't actually uh, talking about what I think is the right uh, policy response to COVID. I was just saying there seems to be a significant minority of the population who are instinctively opposed to it, right? Because, because they've got some uh, vestigial independence in them, some, some spirit of individualism and rugged individualism, right? Don't boss me around. So they may be wrong about what's the right response to COVID. I just mean there is a flicker in the population of instinctive, or what is called populist, instinctive individualism. Um, as for what I think is the right response to COVID, I mean, I've been very, it's been very interesting to look at the, there's been a split within the libertarian popular community, you might say. So uh, if you think, I know, you know, I know a lot of the libertarians who you've, the kind of people who write and publish and that you've heard. I, I know a lot of them personally. I know Sam Bowman. Um, I know uh, Christopher Snowden. Now, Christopher Snowden and Sam Bowman, I don't know if you've seen this, have been having a fantastic kind of Twitter spat. Good natured, because they're friends. But, but they've been mocking each other horribly. It's been quite amusing. And it's interesting that the, the, the older, those of us who are over 45, seem to be more likely to be in the skeptic camp. And the younger ones are more in the, um, in the, the pro-lockdown camp. And I've been wondering why. I, I, it's very, it's interesting. I think that one of the reasons is that the younger ones are more, they're what I would call optimizers. They want to be clever. So they don't like, they like, if you're a doctrinaire and you say, um, no, no, the government must never do anything of the sort. It must never lock people in their own homes, right? It's just a rule. Uh, that seems dumb. That sounds like uh, crude. Why would you ever have that position? Well, the reason I would have that position is that I don't trust governments. I don't trust them to tell us the truth about what's going on. I certainly don't trust them to get the, uh, the answers right about how to solve the problems. They've got all sorts of reasons to do things that aren't actually to get the answer right. And they're not competent to get the answer right. And I think it's much better if you leave things to the mass of people and they will come up with 
arrangements that are much better adapted to the problem that they're facing. But it's a, general, it's a very general rule of thumb and it doesn't really allow you to show off too much. Be clever in, in uh, articles. And you know, I've been amazed to watch the young libertarians all become epidemiologists overnight. You should see them. They're writing on these tweets, they all know. Somehow they all think they bloody know. They're all policy advisors to the government on what to do. They're, they're tacitly uh, supporting this rule by experts. Why? For some reason they want to be experts. They, 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 they want, they, there's such a premium on being smart in that, in that set. Smart in a kind of numbers sense. Smart in a ironic, they're all ironic on Twitter, that they, um, that, that they don't like what you might call earnest old school libertarians. We're dumb, we're crude, right? Um, they all, and so, but the problem is that uh, they're, they're the opposite of the populist libertarian movement that I want, right? The populist libertarian movement I want is a gut instinct almost. Now, it'll be wrong now and then. Of course it will. But there's no other defense against the much greater error of planned economies and, and all this. De You've got to have an instinctual, can I swear on this? Fuck off and leave me alone, right? You've got, if the population does not have that instinct, we're doomed. Well, if I guess it's. Is, look after me. That's I the thing. Know. And it, it requires accepting that the best mechanism for engineering anything is evolution, which in its very mm. nature involves error and things going wrong in order yeah. to tend towards the correct or to tend towards the best design or whatever it is, whether it's in biology or in science or in politics, the idea yes. that ideas oh, are contested and some of them will be bullshit and they have to be argued down. Sometimes they have to play out and be shown to be wrong and then right. we get Would correction. But, but we're in, we seem to be in this society that wants everything to go perfectly at all times and nobody ever to die for the wrong reason or, mm -hmm. you know. It's so odd because it goes hand in hand with contempt for politicians. So you hear lots, of, in Britain at the moment, the left are so contemptuous of the current government they accuse them of all sorts of things, you know, that they're, they're idiots, they're corrupt, they're, you know, it's, you name it. And then they simultaneously demand that the government take a greater role in our lives. It's, it's utterly perverse. So you, you say, I want, I, I, I recognize that these people, the kind of people who get into power in politics, are highly flawed, perhaps flawed even by the standards of human beings, and human beings are, of course, inherently flawed. Um, and yet I want them to solve all my problems by design, not, not in the method that you say, you know, this trial and error, hit and miss, we'll muddle through and we'll get it right. By the way, I think this is where libertarians and, um, well, my style of libertarian, and yours apparently, and conservatives have something in common. So if you think about the Burkean conservatism, that's also the view that the way to proceed is to muddle along and you, uh, you, you kind of work out the best answers. And that's why you shouldn't be too dismissive of the past because they've done that, right? There's a reason things are arranged like they are. It doesn't mean that they're, they're right, but they emerged out of an evolutionary process and they must, have, to some extent, they must have worked, otherwise we wouldn't have them. And that, that's the conservative idea, I think, the libertarian idea that you just expressed, which is very Hayekian, uh, it's got a lot in common with that conservative strain. Oddly enough, a lot of these young libertarians remind me much more of um, certain kind of leftist who thinks, who believes in the perfectibility of society by the, the genius of, well, what, themselves. <laughs> it's, always, perhaps, it's always me. Perhaps that's just the arrogance of the clever young and that they'll they'll grow out of it over time i was probably like that when i was 25. yeah no. i was too actually no that's right I, I didn't i didn't get these ideas in fact what this kind of what you might call hayekian worldview i didn't get until my 40s yeah my, my only problem with burkeanism although i think it's a good idea in some ways is just that well maybe, maybe i'm also an exponent of rationalism and politics to some extent but the problem is that um 
you know, the fact that we have a certain institution and, and that it has worked in the past, I mean, that may be, well be true. And it may, it, it certainly tells us that it doesn't sort of not work, but um, our sort of choice environment in the past has been restricted in certain ways. I mean, things happened uh, partly just because they happened that way. And that doesn't mean there isn't a better way of doing things, right? No, I, I, that's right. But the answer to that is to open up the choice environment. One of the things that I don't think I've written enough about, and I don't think oh, libertarians write enough about, is that we don't want just competition in the supply of goods and services of normal kind. We want competition in the supply of uh, rules. We want different, we want, take the stock market, right? There's not, people talk about the stock market. There are lots of stock markets. There's a the New York Stock Exchange, there's a the London Stock Exchange, there are ones in, you know, all around the world. They have slightly different rules. Um, now, th that's great, government, and governments bloody impede this by telling them what rules they can have. But they have rules about, if you want to list your company on that stock exchange, what information do you need to disclose? What, you know, sometimes they've got rules about if the share price falls more than a certain amount, they shut down trading, so on and so forth, right? There are these different rules. And those are, so they're, they're kind of institutions, they're markets with different rules, and it's good that they do that because it, it turns out that we might prefer some to others. They have pros and cons and they can emerge. And we want, I want to see lots of um, experimentation and uh, with, with um, institutions. And th there hasn't been much in history. And what's weird is that we now, almost everybody wants none. In, in the UK, people are outraged by the fact that different rules apply in different places. Uh, they, they call it a postcode lottery and things like that. What's the problem with that? We, we get to see what works better. We get people can move to where they prefer. I would love to see a world with enormous range of institutions and legal frameworks between which people could move. And yeah. uh, you know, we would then... Uh, I think we could get some convergence, but you'd always have diversity because not everybody has the same preferences. Like, you know, as I say, we get that in shoes and motor cars and so on. I wish we could have it at a deeper level in what you might call ways of life, even. I, I agree, but I, I think I suspect the greatest obstacle to achieving that is not intellectual, it's, it's emotional. Uh, um, I, <clears throat> apart from the fact that it takes a, a deal of thinking about things and a, a certain degree of insight that tends to come in one's fifth decade rather than one's third. Um, the, we're in a culture that values safety very highly, that values security to a dangerous extent, uh, I, I think. Um, and, and people have to be prepared to accept that not only is there risk, there's an inevitability of, of casualty when you, when you take on the idea that evolution is the best way to to sort things out in the long run. If you had, um, no, I think if, if people were free to kind of choose the regimes they lived under, you know, basically imagine a whole lot of, well, if there were just no borders, let's say, or if there were private countries or how you put it, but anyway, most people would, would be pretty conservative. And by conservative, I mean, they'd stick to what the status quo, of course they would. I agree, of course they would. Some people wouldn't and they would, experiment and that would be very interesting to see what happened. Uh, Hayek again I pointed out that liberty directly benefits very few people because take take freedom of speech or freedom of association. It it isn't of any value to you if you have if you don't have unusual opinions. Or you know if, if all your opinions are standard, why would you care about freedom of expression? You you never bump up against the edges of it, right? Same with freedom of association. If you associate with regular people from your suburb, what's the issue? It's fringe characters, let's say, right, uh, who benefit from these things. But society benefits from the fringe characters. They're the ones pushing at the boundaries. They're the ones innovating. And, and if you stifle them, everybody's worse off over the long run. Uh, this, by the way, is my view about why I'm a utilitarian. Actually, uh, I think libertarianism is, I mean, libertarian because I think that over the long run it promotes utility or human welfare. 
And if you want a utilitarian argument in favor of our freedom of speech and freedom of association and all these basic civil liberties, it's because they're extremely valuable over the long run. Not over, over the short run, they cause discombobulation, upset, casualties, as you say. But over the long run, without them, we're going to become, well, it's odd that people who don't like them call themselves progressive because there will be no progress at all. So, so the challenge, the very great challenge, I think, for those of us who, who b believe that is to articulate it in a way that can be understood by people who, as you say, do not stand to benefit, at least in the short term, from, from greater liberty. Uh, what, what, what's the way to do that? How do you go about that? I, I mean, we talk to academics and, I mean, they're all pretty solidly on the left, but, but at least in, in, amongst the best of them, you can have the conversation on inter, in intellectual terms. But in the political realm, you have to convince, if not a majority, then a, a substantial minority that uh, you're right or, or you'll get nowhere. Um, yes. I was on a panel discussion at the Conservative Party conference here in England in 2018. That's right. Um, no, 17. And it was about how to make the case for free markets. And unfortunately, most of the panelists just made the case for free markets, but that wasn't the question. The question was, how do you make it in a way that's compelling to people? And Actually, Jacob Rees-Mogg was on the panel, and we, we didn't get along. Uh, I, uh, I said that, you know, I've been thinking about this, and you know, explaining Hayek's ideas or Adam Smith, uh, it's not going to work, right? And I said, but of course, when we had the period when Britain and the United States were closest to the model that we want, which is the late 19th century, it wasn't because the populations of those countries had read Adam Smith. They've never heard of him. Um, it was because they had a spirit of rugged individualism. And where did that come from? Well, it came from the view that the people who had formally lorded it over ordinary people, kings and queens and lords and dukes and all that stuff, had no right to. They, they, they should piss off. Right? And, and I think the only way we're going to get populist libertarianism is through contempt for our so-called betters. Um, you know, I, I, that's why I'm always dismayed by those on the left who endlessly spew contempt at our so-called betters, but don't draw the obvious conclusion that we should have less government. Right? They, they, they draw the conclusion that we had, should have better government. But I think we're going to promote scepticism about government ever being better, largely because it's populated by wankers. Um, and if we, we that, that's, you know, if we get, people can relate to that. You're this, who is this guy? I mean, you must know this. The people who are running your life in New Zealand, you know, Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda, I, I, she, I've met her a few times when I was in politics. You know, she's a lovely, she's a nice woman, but Jesus Christ, she's got no right to tell me how to live. Right. I'm not taking advice from her. I'm certainly not taking orders from her. Unfortunately, I'll go to fucking prison if I don't, right? I mean, you, you got to get some of that spirit going. I, I, I can't see, it'll never work intellectually. No one's going to go and read Hayek, right? Forget it. Um, it's got to be a gut level thing. And it's got to be, how dare you? But I'm very pessimistic because, as you say, we have um, a very cautious and safety-craving population these days. Um, and I, you know, I don't know. I, I feel very out of tune with it. I, I we should probably wrap up pretty soon, but I, I, I wanted to put to you actually that it, it's interesting because I, I never uh, have identified as a libertarian. I always thought I was some kind of centrist liberal, but, but I'm nodding along when you're talking about this libertarian populism because, you know, I like basic things like free speech. I like the idea that people can vote for the government. So I'll put it to you that in a way what you're talking about is just liberal democracy. It, it's just that in the last 10 years or so, it seems like we, or 20 years, we've gone from a a place where everybody in Canada, New Zealand, you know, the Western world, the free world, 
thought of that as sort of definitive. Certainly people thought of that as definitive to, to their societies when we still had the, the other of the, the USSR to sort of remind us of, of what we were. Um, and in a strange way, one of the most perplexing things for me in the past uh, five or 10 years has been how even the idea of free speech, which used to be seen as foundational quite, quite rightly, has now become this weird kind of fringe thing. Um, and, you know, it's only parties like ACT, which as you say, recently we're getting less than 1% of the, of the vote in New Zealand that are actually standing up for, for these basic values. I th yeah, I think you're right. So I know plenty of people who are not libertarians. People who, um, when I was at Cambridge, let's say, um, were far to the left of me and we kind of disagreed about stuff. But now we complain about a lot of the same things. And they would have always called themselves liberals. Right? They, they may have been on the slightly center, left of center, but certainly they were liberals. And one of the most, I mean, one of the things I found, again, I only really noticed it was even happening about a year ago, on, you can find conferences being thrown here in Britain, uh, 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 called post-liberalism, about post-liberalism. And by the way, they mean this positively. Right? They reject liberalism. Forget libertarianism, liberalism. And on the left, uh, I mean, the kind of people who supported Corbyn and so on. Liberal has become a term of abuse. I, I honestly didn't know what this, I couldn't understand, I honestly couldn't understand it. And I went, I saw this going on on Twitter and I went and I said, look, can someone explain this to me? And it turns out that they think that liberals, who the, Tony Blair would be um, a leading example for them. These are the kind of people who support Corbyn, right? So they use this word liberal pejoratively to out people within the Labour Party who, you know, believe crazy shit like free speech and, you know, that uh, rationality is a universal principle, you know, that kind of stuff. Right? So, so, and it's not illiberalism, anti-liberalism. It's now a big movement on both the left and the right in British politics. And, uh, the most libertarian or liberal guy around is apparently Boris Johnson, a man who has uh, uh, imposed house imprisonment on the population, <laughs> who, who, who's increasing all this nanny state stuff around food because he happens to be fat. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's amazing. I, your kind of position, which I would have said was the norm in academia 20 years ago, when I was in it, you know, the kind of academic is not really highly politicized. They just, you know, they're rubbing along. They're nice people. They believe in democracy. They believe in freedom. You know, they're not rough. Either. That was, you know, it, and it's it, it's a lot of them now. They're just keeping their mouths shut and their heads down because, yeah, you know, they they can get run out of their job for for not doing that. So yeah, it's really really moved along. I mean, I look at the articles I used to publish in the Times. I started publishing in the Times in two thousand and four. I kept doing it until about 2009, they shifted to the Wall Street Journal. So I, I wonder if I would have got some of that stuff published now. And I didn't worry either. The other thing is I did not worry about what I, what I wrote. I yeah. just you know, tossed it out there. I, was, I thought there would be no consequences. Indeed, there were no consequences. Just one final anecdote. I wrote an article the other day that I was quite pleased with, and I sent it to the spectator. And also sent it to a bunch of friends. And the spectator, the guy at the spectator, the editor loved it, and he said, "We're going to publish it." And in fact, he got, he, they, I even got, a, you know, the prints, the proofs sent to me. But friends of mine came back, said, "You better be careful. I think you'll get cancelled." In particular, they thought I'd lose the work I have in the corporate world. And you know, things aren't great at the moment financially here in Britain for me, and I really can't afford to lose that corporate work. And to my shame. I wrote to the spectator and I said, sorry, please don't publish it. I've got to keep earning a living. I've got kids to feed. Um, I must say, I really did. I honestly lost sleep over this. I, I was really, I'm really humiliated by it. Um, but that would never have occurred to me 10 years ago. Never, not even five, wouldn't have occurred to me. No. To do that. And, I, and I did it.
it's a slightly depressing note on, on which to end, but I, I suspect that we'll have to go through quite a crisis to turn this around. I, I, I'm not sure that people will just change their minds through fashion or, or something like that. I, I, I suspect the trajectory is, is more depressing than that, and, and it will really take quite substantial suffering to bring people to their senses. <laughs> Well, I mean, I know that you know, that, that that little episode, that anecdote. I mean, it's it, it's not unusual at all. I mean, as you know, and I and I, you know, just doing a, a tiny bit of work within academia about viewport diversity and things like that. It's amazing how quickly people start writing to you as if I can help, um, and saying, you know, I feel the same way, and I, I can't publish what I my research uh, and things like that. So it's, it's, an, it's an amazingly common thing, uh, even though we're still supposedly living in liberal democracies, but yep. maybe we truly have the, entered a post-liberal age. The self-censorship is probably the biggest effect. I mean, you know, you can say, well, how many cases have there really been of, you know, people getting prosecuted or whatever, you know, or even losing their jobs? I mean, there have been plenty of people losing their jobs, but, you know, how many? Well, however many there are of that, there are, hundreds and hundreds for each one of those thousands probably of people just uh, don't go there and that, so the self censorship is is massive and uh, you know over the long run it can only hold back western society yeah okay and i mean this is part of the project here i suppose in a very in a very small way so far we're trying to build up a sort of culture around uh Free speech, well, good on you. Uh, open thinking. And there's the Free Speech Union you obviously know about in the UK. We both actually, oh, the Free Speech Coalition in New Zealand, we both done a podcast for, but we, I, I'm also a member of the, of the Toby Young uh, led right. Free Speech Union. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that is actually the way forward because they actually have a, have a, a bit more teeth in a, in a legal sense. I think um, it's good to sort of talk and do podcasts and stuff, but um, I mean, I'm also a member of Heterodox Academy and I hugely admire them. My worry with them is just that it's um, it's sort of just talking, and and when you do get attacked, you know what's the what's the pushback? That, that that's really the question now. Yeah, in the uh, in the well, I don't know. In the states, there's some uh, various people who organisations that take legal action in defence of people. Um, of course, in New Zealand, uh, the legal protections are much weaker. So, I, you know, I don't if they. I haven't really been closely following um, the government's proposed regulations about speech in New Zealand, but if they go through, I mean, there won't be legal defence as well, though. I mean, probably well, will. You, 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 the Bill of Rights in New Zealand is rather weak compared to proper constitutional. I mean, it's just another law, right? That's right, and it, I think it can be overridden by by other laws, and and, and yeah. certainly the the government will almost certainly proceed with so-called hate, hate speech laws banning uh, vilification on religious grounds. And that strikes me as a really dangerous road to go down because who knows what vilification means when it comes to religion. You, you could end up with... Who knows, who knows what religion means? Well, I mean, that's right. Uh, yeah. expand the scope. In the United Kingdom, the Equality Act... Um, uh, you, You've got, you know, you the protected characteristics, the what, sex, uh, religion, race, you can imagine the normal list. Well, they added to it beliefs. Uh, what's a belief? A belief is something that has a uh, profound effect on the way, so a deeply held opinion, which has a profound effect on the way you live your life or something like that. And so somebody pointed out, someone said, well, look, that would mean that Nazism is, being a Nazi is a protected belief. So I can't disparage someone for being a Nazi, right? And then they said, no, 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 there's another clause you don't understand. A belief is not just what I described to you. A belief is also something that is worthy of respect in a democratic society. What the fuck does that mean? That is entirely arbitrary. Um, that means that basically means that the government, the ministers, you know, the, the, they have the right to just arbitrarily decide what 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 can be criticised and what can't be criticised. But really, once you're going to protect religion, the problem is that so few people are religious nowadays. Other people will say, well, why should my beliefs not have protection? You know? 
in the United Kingdom, they're about to make, if you attack somebody because they're a goth, you, you don't know what a goth is, right? A, a teenager who puts on lots of makeup and has yeah and yeah. dyes their hair black and mm. and, and the emo and a barbarian in the late Roman Empire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you attack, if, if somebody, if you get attacked because you're a um, a goth or an emo, that's now going to be a worse crime than if you get attacked just because you happen to be there. Um, so th th this is the extension of identity protection. And there's really no, because there's no logical reason to pick one other than the other, what will ha it will happen that it all gets extended. Right? Yeah. And so when, when you say attacked, you mean verbally attacked, not physically attacked. No, no, right? physically attacked. It's an, oh. aggravated, it's an aggravating factor in a crime. So I can, I, and, and also the test for all these aggravating factors is whether or not the victim believes that that was the motivation. So it, this is in British law now. If I say, if you, did it, was it a racist attack, right? I mean, I beat you up and you're a different race from me. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I was beating up because you're a different race, right? So what's the test for whether or not I did do that? The say so of the, the other person. The same with speech. If, I, if I'm rude to you uh, and you're a different race to me and the person says that you were rude, to, I was rude to you because you're a different race, then, then that's that's it. You know, that's there's no defence. That, that, that the the victim decides. Victim. So yeah, the things are going. I'm I'm sorry. I'm being very pessimistic and negative. But it's the trend is all in one direction, right? All one way. And the other thing is that all the people who stand up against sort of cast as cranks. You know, you pay a price. You guys are being very brave. I, I admire you. You know, I, I didn't do it. I was uh, I was a coward and published my article in the in the Spectator. But you're being very courageous. So I really I'm, I, I admire you. Well, uh, for what it's worth, I, I admire you as well. Notwithstanding the Spectator incident, you you're, you've <laughs> displayed a lot of courage, and you're in a much more exposed position than James or I. <laughs> well, I actually, you know, one of the things I told myself when I uh, did, did, didn't send the article is I, I told myself, so I've, I've fucking given enough to this. Uh, you know, I've, I've spent the last 15, 16 years basically on the, you know, trying to promote liberty in various ways, mainly economic liberty, but just generally. And, uh, you know, it's, I mean, that's why I was so happy about what I saw with ACT, but otherwise, you know, my, my efforts have been met with no success and uh, have come at considerable personal expense. So I, I kind of told myself, you know, I've done enough for the cause. It didn't stop me feeling ashamed, though. Uh, and, you know, given the way things are going, I might just say, oh, fuck it, you know, I'll we'll go uh, down with the shit. That, that, that's it in the end. I, I've got small children to look after as well, and I guess push hasn't come to shove for me yet. But I like to think that if it did, then what would go through my mind would be that I want my daughters to remember me as somebody who stood up when it counted rather than somebody who ducked and covered for safety <laughs> sake at yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I agree. I just think my, my kids might well look at me and say, you bloody idiot. <laughs> <laughs> they may well do that, but that, that's what kids do. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for having me. And uh, stick at it. Thank you, Jamie. We really appreciate it. <laughs> No Thanks problem. so much for doing this, Thanks. yeah. Uh, thanks.